Tane Hatte, ihr Lady. Vergiss es.
das Bild, was jetzt gerade auf, auf der Hauptwand ist, das sollen Sie auf der Hauptwand lassen. Äh, links den Namen und rechts Live-Bild. Und äh, Moderation geht auf die Bühne. Ah, yes. Yeah. Oh. <lacht> yeah. Oh no. Back to the project showcase uh, slide here. Okay, there we go. And then let's check. Die sind auch leicht verpeilt. Ich habe keine Ahnung. Ja, wir fangen an, gehen auf die Bühne. Äh, okay, mach mal. Also die ersten Präsentatoren sind zu zweit. Zwei Headsets dann. Äh, Handsender. Headsets, Headsets, Headsets. I think this is... <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to our uh, project showcase. Um, veterans of the XI uh, conference know that this is a regular um, session that we put on, an agenda, uh, on the agenda as a way to really, um, within a session, get a full glimpse of um, the many projects, resources, initiatives that are happening in our community, uh, in Europe, but also uh, often across the globe. So uh, yeah, it's a very intensive, uh, a very intensive session, but uh, full of energy. And, uh, and we are very excited to have you with us and to see such a nice turnout for uh, <laughs> presenters today. And Lucy will walk you through uh, how things are going to run. Yes, yeah, so as we have many projects today to present, we've asked each participant to bring an object, and they will each have two minutes to uh, present their project through this object. Uh, just a few information. So this session is broadcasted live on YouTube. So then if you want to share the link, you can. Uh, to be sure that we stay on time, uh, we will time you with uh, my little phone here, and you will hear this sound after two minutes. So you will know that your time is reached. Uh, I think we can start with the first presentation now. Is it? Let's uh, find out what the Red Valley is uh, by uh, 
our double presenters today, uh, Patrick and Marcus. Welcome. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Patrick, and this is my colleague, Marcus. We are from Red AI Center at the University of Tübingen. And to tell you a little bit about our project, we brought something for you. I got it in my bag. It's a robot. Yes. A sweet guy. So cute. Uh, his name is Nao, by the way. It's a singing and dancing robot. So he's able to learn to sing and to dance together with humans. But we got one problem. We cannot access his brain anymore because we cannot uh, use his artificial intelligence anymore. He just looks good. He's cute. He's somehow fancy. But that's it. And the simple reason for that is that we forgot the password. Someone even put a sticker on it, password unknown. This is true. And without password, there's no artificial intelligence. And now, of course, only serves as a metaphor in our story here. Because when we discuss what AI is actually capable of, um, we have the problem that we often conflate reality with imaginations or um, statistical methods for futuristic visions. And when we really want to get to the heart of AI, want to really discuss it, we need to unlock our an understanding of what AI is doing and like get a password to really understand that. At our Tubing and Red AI Center, we try to do that in manifold ways, and I would just want to highlight just three of them. First, um, we offer science communication formats in Tubing and, and uh, nationwide uh, to engage with various um, interest groups. Second, we have a journalist in residence program where science journalists can come to Tübingen and can learn and talk about AI in a deeper and better way. And third, we offer courses for scientists themselves, learning um, or enhancing their rhetorical skills. And with these ways, we want to engage with the public and we want to unlock new knowledge about AI and maybe even someday we get now back to work. Um, next, we are happy to welcome on stage Stuart James from the Fondazione Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia. Welcome. Hi, so this is a bit of a change from the previous. I don't have anything cute. I've got a mobile phone instead. And uh, phones give us uh, amazing access to the internet and the world around us and millions of articles of information. However, much of this content doesn't provide a connection to the human factor the intangible experience, and therefore focuses on the dominant and common narrative in society. In contrast, the MEMEX project promotes social inclusion through collaborative heritage-related tools um, that provide inclusive access to tangible and intangible heritage. At the same time, the project facilitates encounters, discussions, and interactions between and among communities at risk of social inclusion. We consider socially fragile targets that are systematically blocked um, from various cultural opportunities and resources, such as refugees, uh, migrant women, and populations excluded due to poverty. The tool we develop empowers these communities by wielding together their fragmented experiences and memories into uh, compelling geolocalized storylines and uh, using new personalized digital content through artificial intelligence then to, pre to link to pre-existing cultural heritage within Europe. This tool is embodied through an application, hence the phone, um, facilitating writing, connecting, and viewing of stories, but not only in 2D maps, uh, as you commonly see, but extended into 3D through augmented reality allowing the viewer to become immersed in the interconnected nature of not just the storylines, but the connections to the cultural heritage in society around them. The MEMICS project allows communities to tell their stories and to claim their rights and equal participation within European society. To this end, MEMICS uh, nurtures actions that contribute to, rather than undermine, the practice, uh, practices which recognize differences in society. 
and by giving individuals a voice and promoting cultural diversity. Wow. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. We did not time that, but just right. Thank you. Thank you, Sir James. Uh, welcome, Carla. The Thank you yours. so much. Uh, my name is Carla Puglia. I'm coming from Uppsala University in Sweden, and I'm here today with the two of my colleagues uh, because we wanted to share the idea of a project for which we are searching for partners among you. So if you have a, a part of an exposition or a, a some demonstration kits that you don't use anymore or any kind of material that would make uh, the learning and the understanding of science for young people easier and joyful, uh, please consider the possibility that these materials can be sent to Africa. We at Uppsala University are working at the International Science Program, which is a unit supporting research group in physics, mathematics, and chemistry in low-income countries. This means that we have a lot of uh, colleagues in different universities over all the Africa. So what we want is actually, con you should consider that we uh, have this uh, access, and uh, many of our uh, um, colleagues in Africa spend a regular visit to to schools uh, because they wanted to recruit uh, a new uh, young talents with special focus actually with uh, girls to science. To send th this, uh, these schools are so poor that they don't have money neither for pencil or for papers. So this means that uh, there is no way that they have a demonstration kits or a training lab. So sending this kind of materials to these schools would not only inspire young people to science, but also will contribute to improve the teaching methods for science towards a more conceptual-based one. So please, I hope that many of you would be interested to collaborate, cooperate with us. I'm here, Carla, and my two colleagues, Ulrike and Barbara, you can recognize us because we have similar scarves. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our next speaker is Andrew Whittington Davis from Excite. Oh. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, okay, um, the item I'm going to showcase to you all. Um, who in here has a phone on room right now? Put up your hand. Most people do. Um, who in here is logged into Facebook right now? Ah, not too many. OK, who in here has been convinced that their phones have been listening to them, listening to their conversations? Quite a lot of you. Um, OK, it's hard to imagine how that can actually be happening, but we do actually know how that's happening. Um, quite often, we've had a lot of focus on data privacy across Europe now. But essentially, our phones, the apps that we use, accurately predict our behaviors as we go. And some people would say that the discussion around data privacy should have come a lot earlier in the process. Um, which is introduces the, the project that I want to showcase to you today, which is TechEFOS, which is a three-year EU project. Um, it has nothing to do with phones, but it does have a lot to do with technology, in particular new and emerging technologies that have yet to come to sort of full development. So the idea behind TechEFOS is that we essentially um, capture a lot of societal awareness, ethical values around these technologies, before they come to development. So the technologies that TechEFOS is focusing on is around technologies of neurotech, uh, digital extended reality, so AR, VR sort of stuff, and climate engineering. And it's going to do that through a number of ways, by working with industry, academia, uh, the public as well, through public consultation events, uh, exhibitions, and also working with 13 other EU projects. So they formed a cluster group which sort of uh, finding a common voice in that sort of field. And the idea is that by the end of it, we would have ethical and legal frameworks and guidelines for industry and academia so that these technologies can be produced with society's values in mind. Um, so with that in mind, how did I do? Is that we're good? OK, well, if you want to come and chat about TechEFOS, how we selected the technologies, if you want to join our EU cluster group, maybe, um, come chat to me. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. And Miranda, will you tell us a word about tomorrow? Actually, oh. I'm a colleague of Miranda. 
and Miranda's over there. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I got a question for you. So think with me. In what world do you want to live? In a green world, a healthy world, a world where children can grow up happily, or in a free world? Think a moment for yourself. That was the question we asked to over 500 visitors of the local libraries in the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands in our project, A Word About Tomorrow. So I'm curious, so can I ask you, what world do you want to live in? The sustainable world, the green world, perfect. Then I would have taken you now to Steffi, our climate researcher, sitting somewhere here in the public library. And Steffi would offer you a cup of tea, and she would ask you about your choice, about your hopes, your dreams, your concerns for the future. And you would have a chat together. And at the end of the conversation, you would have write down um, a question, a research question. You put it on the line, and that question hopefully could realize that future world, that sustainable world. Well, we organized this program to reach the unreachables in collaboration with the public libraries of, of the city of Utrecht, and also to train researchers to uh, connect with a broad audience. And it worked. Actually, it was more successful than we hoped for. We uh, let researchers jump out of their own bubble in university, and we let a very diverse group of people, both in age and in background, um, participate in the dialogues. Almost all people we, wanted, we asked to join wanted to. And we're very happy about that. And we found out that this worked because we started this program just as I started this, this pitch today, with a question that is relatable and urgent. And also, maybe even more important, it worked because the researchers really listened to the people we, they were talking to and took everyone very seriously. So we organized 500 dialogues, and we hope to have a little dialogue with you as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, we can leave it on stage. Yeah. Ah, our next presenter will be Marcia Mazzonetto from the Mosaic Project. Maybe we can just move this a bit around. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage that they are not looking, so I, I can get a few more seconds. Um, so my object is actually a postcard, and I'm really sorry because I would have never imagined that the room would be so huge, so you might not be able to see it. But it's actually a postcard where you can find a mosaic of sticky dots in the shape of a heart, and it actually represents two very dear things to us. Uh, one is Mosaic, which is a project that we coordinate. Uh, it's funded by the European Commission, and we work with several cities in Europe that have taken a very, very important challenge on, on them. They want to become climate neutral by 2030. They are part of this mission on climate neutrality from the European Commission. So what we do with them is we actually try to get them to do this through a co-creation approach. So instead of going out to citizens, for example, and just asking them, well, would you prefer that and that or that or that, and then making all the decisions by themselves, we actually try to get them to involve the citizens, involve the researchers, and involve the private sector to co-develop shared solutions, because we think that this is really the way uh, to make people engage on a long term and make everyone feel like they are part of the change towards this climate neutrality. And these sticky dots also represent our company, which is called, guess what? Sticky Dot, of course. Um, we do offer um, lots of services around co-creation, but not only. We work on science communication in general, and you will hear something about it from a colleague of mine uh, very soon. Um, we are actually have a really nice booth at the Business Bistro, number 59. So if you'd like to stop by, you can actually have one of these postcards and write a message to a random participant who will receive it after the conference, and we will send it to them. So we hope to see you there. Thank you.
Thank you, thank you, Mancia. And uh, may I invite on stage Siri um, to talk to us about life through the looking glass. Hi, my name is Siri, and I'm a doctoral researcher at the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Today, I brought with you a QR code. This QR code is the physical access point to the online exhibition Life Through the Looking Glass that I've curated and would like to share with you today. In fact, it's the only really physical object that I have printed on a several marketing mat ma material that I have there. Um, to this online exhibition, because what we exhibit is typical contemporary biological research, the research of the EvoCell network that is looking at tiny molecules and cells. So we didn't have any authentic or cool-looking taxidermy animals to exhibit, but we did have lots of digital images and data that make something visible inside the research process. And that's exactly what we're focusing on, the processes in science. So we wanted to show the way to something and also how the scientific objects are actually being used and with it portray science as more authentic. The, really the goal was to create something different. And um, so throughout my PhD research, I found that often science is really communicated too often as something finished, giving the idea that science provides clear answers. And this is also in the heads of the scientists. I interviewed scientists in the course of three years, and their main argument for not communicating more about their research was there were simply no big results. So instead of hyping up scientific findings through flashy signing headlines, let's focus on the processes in science. This development of this online exhibition was a huge learning process for me. And I hope it can be, uh, you can take from it something too. And uh, yeah, feel free to chat with me um, and um, gain access to the online exhibition. Would love to share it with you. Thank you. <laughs> and now I call on stage Marie Quedic from Excite. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Marie from the Excite team and I will present to you Doors, the digital incubation for museum. So I'm really sorry I picked this really, really li little object. <laughs> I didn't know it could be such a big room. So this little object is an operational amplifier. So it's, basic, it's a really simple device that amplifies low intensity signal to strong intensity signal. Uh, so it basically behaves like a megaphone where the input signal is the voice of a person and this little thing is a megaphone and it's exactly what we aim to do with DOORS. Uh, we, uh, so the DOORS is a project funded under uh, H2020 uh, for two years and we have three partners uh, Ars Electronica in Austria, Museum Booster in Austria, and Excite. So the overarching aim of DOORS is to help uh, small and, um, and medium-sized organizations to uh, achieve uh, their transformation, digital transformation journey, and we are here to help them. Uh, to, uh, to I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost. <laughs> It's my first time on stage and it's quite impressive. Uh, <laughs> so through a two-stage um, pilot scheme, we will help a museum and um, small organization to um, complete their pilot through a skill building and um, to a skill building and uh, incubation program. The first part, 40 pil pilots will uh, enter in the um, skill building program with mentors and uh, experts to help them. Um, and in the second stage, 20 of them will be um, uh, implementing their digital uh, project. Uh, so if you want more information and with a, a bit less stressed person, that I, I will be at the Excite uh, Business Bistro and I can give you more information about that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and now we call Alex Argemi. I hope I pronounced it right. You pronounced it beautifully, but it's really Alex Argemi. 
Uh, Sorry, thank you, that's fine. <laughs> I like yours too. Well, uh, I'm the head of marketing and communication at the ICN2, the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, a very cool research center, very close to Barcelona, a very cool city too. And there we do from basic research about nanoscience to very, very applied research. Applied research in fields like energy, nanomedicine, uh, technology. And within uh, nanomedicine, we have a very, very beautiful project called BrainCom. Brain for brain and com for communication. Uh, what our researchers are trying to do is to use graphene, a very cool material too, eh, a flat material that is able to detect electrical signals, very, very small electrical signals, and we can get information from the brain to try to help a patient uh, to talk again. Persons who lost their ability to move their muscles in the face after an aphasia or after an ictus, uh, but still can build the language on their head, they can try to move the muscles and we can read that motor information. We are not reading minds yet, we are reading motor information and translating this information straight from the brain into words. Uh, it's not yet at the clinical stage, but there is a spin-off that is moving forward the research of the project and it's looking very good. Maybe, maybe it will be reality soon. But how can we show that? It's really difficult to show nanotechnology. We build uh, things like that that allows us to show the actual probes that we want to use in the brain. But we can get closer and we want to talk about the technology from the inside. And that's why we built Vraincom with a V and an R for virtual reality. With one of these adapters, I have a few abroad in my backpack, eh, as many as I could, not many, so you have to come soon. Uh, we can turn your phone into a virtual reality device and not only show you an animation about the project, but invite you into some of the labs that are making it possible, where you will meet a lot of people behind this very, very interesting research that might make a difference. Eh? And after all that, we invite you to think about the ethical implications of that research. So if you want to, to talk about how painful it is to do that kind of application and, and mess a little bit with your minds, come visit me in that corner afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for that. And uh, the suitcase is coming up on stage uh, together with Mariana. Welcome. Hello. Uh, everyone should have the opportunity to reach their full potential, and that includes the possibility to access, understand, enjoy, and value science. Lack of local infrastructure or equipment can sometimes hinder the opportunities of researchers and students, but we must address these inequalities so that talented people have the conditions to do science if and how they want to. With Lab in a Suitcase, you can perform research and educational activities in a more independent manner. With the equipment to perform molecular biology and ecology, and ecology experiments, this kit is portable, versatile, and easy to maintain. This open science project was developed tailored to the needs and wishes of partner researchers in the five Portuguese-speaking African countries. This kit includes a magnifying glass, a densitometer, micro pipettes, a bento lab kit with a thermocycler, a mini centrifuge, and an electrophoresis tank, and a makeshift incubator. Ten scientists in Angola, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, São Tomé and Príncipe, and Mozambique are using uh, this kit with their own lab in a suitcase kit to perform education and scientific research activities. For example, in São Tomé and Príncipe Archipelago, biology professor Ugulai Maia performed the first ever PCR in the history of University of São Tomé with his lab in a suitcase kit with his university students. Lab in a Suitcase is managed by the Gulbenkian Collaborative Center in the Gulbenkian Science Institute in Portugal and is financed by the Merck Family Foundation and Oeiras Municipality. And with Lab in a Suitcase, the Gulbenkian Collaborative Center wants to contribute to the global agenda of science democratization. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mariana. Uh, we've heard uh, in her speech uh, the idea of enjoying science. So welcome, Michael, for the Enjoy project. Hi, thanks very much. I'm Michael Krieg from Sticky Dots in Brussels, Belgium. You heard from my colleague Mats here earlier on. I want to ask you, can you raise your hand if you're a science communicator? Okay, it's the majority of people. And do you evaluate your science communication practice? Hands in the air. Yeah, some of you. But on what basis? So what makes outstanding 
open science communication. Uh, this is the question at the heart of the Enjoy project. So my object is uh, the gold medal. Uh, what do we consider as outstanding open science communication? Uh, what are the standards, principles, and indicators uh, which let us know that this is we're really achieving our objectives in science communication? Uh, Enjoy is a massive project to answer a massive question. And what's beautiful about Enjoy is it's a co-creation process. So all over Europe, co-creation workshops are bringing together stakeholders in science communication, science journalism, um, from right across the board to discuss what should define the standards, principles, and indicators that make outstanding science journalism. Uh, Sticky Dots is a partner in the project. We're halfway through. It's exciting. We're getting together to our European consensus workshop coming up soon. And if you want to hear more about it, come and talk to us at uh, booth 59. May I? Oh, I'm just looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And uh, a warm welcome to Alix on stage. <laughs> to, uh, Talk to us about the Sockets project. This is really using all resources on stage, yeah? yeah. Ready? So I'm really happy to be here today with you and really happy to present these uh, wonderful objects that I bring uh, with me today, and I know what you are all thinking now, but I just brought the ugliest socks that I have in my wardrobe, and this is not completely true. What you have here today is the most updated collection of lost socks from the Excite team, just a gift from us uh, to you, um, and I'm sure you have a lot of lost socks in your wardrobe as well. Uh, what is interesting about them is that even if it can be kindly still useful, they are clearly incomplete and they have lost their purpose. And we are all des desperately looking for the other pair to make them you know, complete again and to give them back their purpose and their meaning. And the project that I'm presenting today is doing exactly that. It's trying to bring back uh, meaning and purpose into the development of technological exhibition and to align that with the values of society and the needs of society. The project is called Sockets. I know that Sockets means something in English, but I hope that with these ugly socks, you will at least remember the name of the project. Uh, it's a European funding project. It's about societal engagement. It's not the first one, it's not the last one, uh, but this project is one of the first ones trying to reshape the way how innovation based on key enabling technologies, such as a um, micro photonics and micro electronics uh, are uh, developed. Uh, this project involves science engagement professionals, but also uh, agency for innovation across Europe. And together we developed a co-creation uh, methodology to bring citizens uh, to the table and to observe what it does change in the process of developing um, innovation based on technologies. Uh, the results of this process, of this co-creation and so societal engagement process, will be uh, revealed in an exhibition, in four exhibitions, that are currently uh, designed by science centers and museums across Europe in Estonia, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Italy. Uh, it will open in 2023, so please uh, keep in touch. Um, and if you have an uh, ugly socks that look like one of ours, please come take it, bring it back home, and make a new pair of socks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Um, may we give the floor to uh, PLV? Um, welcome. Tell us more about... Hello. Science. I'm PLV from Oha Science Center. Very easy to remember. And uh, I introduced you a project which we did together with uh, four uh, science centers and one theater. As uh, how many of you like science theater shows? Raise your hands. At least half. Well, guess what? Children love science shows as well, and they would like to do them by themselves. So we created together with Iceland, Norway, uh, Sweden, Estonia, a project where we decided that we will make a science show. And we wanted to make it as easy as possible, but then COVID hit. So we had to move forward and think about the science show which doesn't uh, get hit by COVID. And uh, that's why I'm having my phone and uh, my headphones as well. Uh, and uh, 
we developed the science show, which is actually a moving uh, kind of a podcast, but we call it audio science show. So an ordinary student needs a bottle of water, a uh, phone, and uh, something to listen to it. And uh, students go to the nature with the bottle of water, do experiments during this journey, listen what the storyteller is telling. There are three, three different stories. And uh, afterwards, they can uh, discuss it at the school or wherever they are doing, even in kindergarten. And uh, another part in here, they can do science show as well. There are quite many directions. And it's all in uh, different languages. And uh, it was supported by Nord Plus. And you are very welcome to come and uh, hear the show by yourself. Or you can ask how we did it. And uh, you can also translate it to your language. And uh, please come. We are here with Sabine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lali, it's your turn now to tell us more about Terrifica. Hi, guys. I'm Lala, I'm coming from Belgrade, Serbia. Maybe recently you realized that we in Serbia became obsessed with some complex subjects like health, well-being, learning, climate. Hmm? And, and they would like to do them by themselves. So we created together with as easy as possible, but then COVID. Uh, science uh, get hit by COVID, and uh, that's why I'm having my and, uh, and uh, we developed the science show, which is actually a moving uh, uh, phone, something to listen and uh, go to the nature with the bottle of water. regions across Europe about climate changes, about our consequences and manifestations that we are so fiercely ex experiencing nowadays. This is an extract from Belgrade's map, consequences and manifestations that we are so ex experiencing nowadays. From Belgrade's map. From Belgrade's map. And here you can see by our citizens, together with some, some complex, sometimes even funny comments, like the central square of Belgrade, Republic of, uh, square of Republic, with, with, uh, with the map of the town called Melting Point. And another one, so close to forest, but at the same time, so far away. And then there are really extremely funny comments like, bus stop from hell. Obviously, Belgrade isn't hell, really, maybe. Let's say semi-hell. Or my favorite, block 43. It's a total quarter of Belgrade. 43 block is only concrete. And do check our, our crowd mapping tool. It is open for six regions. <laughs> How to turn a... Thank you for this object. Uh, Beata, the floor is yours. Welcome. Hello, I'm Beate, um, and I work with Wissenschaft im Dialog, uh, Science in Dialog in Berlin. And I brought you this hydrogen car, um, and it stands for being on the road for energy transition. Um, and as we all know, energy transition, this topic is uh, getting more and more important these days. Um, and our project, Power to Change, Mission Energiewende, Energiewende is energy transition in German, um, is not only about a traveling exhibition, which will visit uh, seven towns uh, um, all around Germany. Um, we have also um, a accompany accompanying uh, formats because we want to um, hear what the people think about energy transition. Um, we want to get their opinions on the topic. Um, and that's why we uh, convert a trailer. Um, we are taking exhibits on energy and energy transition with us. 
and we are going on marketplaces, uh, in parks or in shopping areas with the trailer and trying to attract the people to come near and to um, occupy with the um, exhibits and to get in dialogue with them. And uh, the input or the, some of the input we get uh, from the people will then be integrated uh, in the traveling exhibition which will be in that area a few weeks later. So maybe the people come back to the traveling exhibition and find their own input in uh, the exhibition. Um, the exhibition itself is developed by two different museums, um, symbolizing the different way handling with energy. One traditional museum, um, industry, uh, industrial museum uh, in the rural area in Germany, um, um, LWL Industrie Museum, and a modern science center uh, dedicated to climate issues, the Klimahaus in Bremerhaven. And there are many uh, other scientific partners in that project. And uh, my colleague Tobias and me, we are uh, happy to ask, uh, answer your questions now. Thank you, thank you so much, Beata. Um, it's my pleasure to invite Stefanos to tell us about water mining. Welcome. Hello, my name is Stefanos. I would like to talk to you a little bit about uh, the water mining project. Um, the water mining is looking into um, clean water and uh, it's trying to address the challenge of um, by 2030 clean water, the uh, demand for clean water will um, far exceed um, its supply. So um, the water mining project is trying to address this um, problem by um, doing a couple of things, um, by looking into innovative technologies and methodologies that, um, that look into um, um, the issue of um, desalination and um, the, also the problem of um, the um, water treatment, um, waste um, water treatment, and is trying to do this by introducing more um, energy efficient and more um, um, how do I say, uh, energy efficiency and um, less polluting ways of um, delivering this. Now, um, in addition of um, doing this, it's also looking into elements of circular economy and it's also doing a little bit of um, public awareness as we're doing right here. Um, in the issue of, in relation to the issue of circular economy, um, I would like to introduce you the project that I brought with me. This was given to me um, a few um, hours ago. It was um, brought my, by, um, um, from, from the Netherlands before it was insured for a few thousand um, euros. Um, these are um, two pieces of jewelry. And um, this um, jewelry, um, jewelry is made to um, make people look beautiful. And um, so you can say in the eyes of, the, at least of the maker and at, in the eyes of the people who um, um, are going to choose it, um, they are um, and this beautiful. It, apart, apart from being beautiful, they're also crap. And why do I say this? Because they're made of um, granules, they're made of um, resources that are um, derived from the, um, from the, um, sludge from the purification system. So, um, so it's a little bit shit, but it's also very beautiful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Stefanos. Um, and now we invite Silvia for the last presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Have you ever found some of those great, great, great ideas that look easy, fitting, that you know you have to prove it and they have to work because they are so great? And then when you go and try them, they're much more complex than you have anticipated? 
I could be talking about a lot of things, but no, I'm especially specifically talking about partnerships between schools and r museums or research institutions, cultural institutions. It's, it sounds like a great idea. We have shared goals. We both value knowledge and education, and we care about society. So we should be able to collaborate and make a great project. Try it. Just go and try it, and you'll see. We have done it a lot of things. We have done it more than 30 times. And uh, we are the magnet project. That's why I've both mag I brought magnets here. And we are inviting you to know what we have learned with that experience over there, OK, where we are placed. You know, magnet project is a magnet that's aimed to fight against school segregations. It's a collaboration between Fundació Jaume Bufill and the Department of Education of Catalonia. And uh, what we do is we take schools that are not very attractive to the families around there. And we just try to make there an educational project that's really magnetic and attractive for them. That's why we may try to do this, <laughs> attract families to the schools. And uh, the main tool to do that is partnership, that collaboration with an external institution. OK? So if you want to learn what I do know what we have learned, we'll explain it to you. Another question we've got, we are asking for your help, is we are trying to improve because we have got a lot of successes we are proud of, but we've had some failures from which we have tried to learn. And one of the things we have learned is our teachers would need knowing more things around the world. So we are looking for workshops, propositions, mm, I don't know, uh, things to do for our teachers that uh, you could have and could think would be interesting to improve still more of our schools. If you've got some of them, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. For, uh, you can pass it on to, to our colleague down there. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for uh, taking our format, uh, playing with it, um, actually not letting me use the, the belt too much. So thank you for playing along and for keeping the session very nice and dynamic and for uh, really uh, bringing what we can say are stories to us and to the community. So uh, uh, we realized that an, a big auditorium that is hard to change and uh, customize is not the best format for the second half of this session, which would have, uh, is the networking uh, part. That's why we, we really ask for your understanding and uh, apologize uh, for the situation. And we'd like to ask all uh, presenters to put their hands up. Um, so now you've got uh, 18 different faces with a story that you can meet uh, today uh, for the remainder of the session, but also throughout the two conference days. So please don't hesitate to uh, come up uh, closer to the front of the stage. Uh, this seems to be the team, right? <laughs> ah, <laughs> uh, no, uh, 40 seconds left by my clock. Um, and, uh, and really uh, engage with them about their stories. So. I think that's Thank all. Thank much. you so much. Yeah.